So I have talked about uh, the object of study of, 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 of ours, namely about voltage distributed algorithms. I just want to, to motivate it now, uh, in retrospect, why we did that. Um, it's, for us, it's important that you understand what we're actually working on, right? If you would say we verify C programs, every one of you knows what the C program is, and everyone has an intuition. The problem is we, we, are, we are working on these distributed algorithms, which are these, these, these designs, these high-level fault tolerance mechanisms, and I wanted to have some kind of uh, some common base some common base we are, we are working on. So the point is that we have, we have worked on this verification of these of this high-level designs, and for us the motivation was right clear from the beginning. And recently, uh, we stumbled over a, a, a paper by, by engineers from Amazon, and I want to share some of their, their insights with you, because these insights very much motivate, motivate what we are doing in the last year. So why, why do we, so and the second part will be about modeling. So why do we care so much about, about modeling and, and, and verification? And uh, Chris Newcomb and, and his colleagues from, from Amazon have uh, published a technical report on their findings on how they approach verification in the industry and what lessons they learned. And we have some very nice they have some very nice insights. We you you really feel their, their need and their urge to have tool support and to have uh, verification to help them to make their systems correct. So they start by saying that they have they found that the verification techniques that they use in the industry, they are, they, are, they are necessary, but they're not sufficient. And then they list what kind of verification techniques they use. They use design reviews, code reviews, static analysis, uh, stress testing, fault injection. And then they say, but still, still we can have subtle, subtle bugs in there. Okay? We are all this testing, it's just, you know, we're just at the, at the tip of the iceberg of what can happen in a system. And actually, in concurrent fault tolerance systems, bugs can still be in there. And the second thing they say, which is very important for us, also is that they say, to, def to find design faults, you should not do source code testing, okay? Source code testing is very good if you want to, to test whether the code actually implements the design that you have, right? Because this is the, the level of, you know, you can test the function, you can test the procedure, but if you have a bigger design involving multiple computers, testing the code, they say it's uh, it's not adequate because it has too much information. There's too much detail in there to find these high-level high uh, errors in design. And they say here, reachable states of the code is astronomical. So. Um, at the same time, when we, when we think back about what I talked about in the first part of the lecture, we had this algorithm and basically given you in English, right? It was not a programming language. It was very informal, there were no clear semantics, so I had to explain you somehow intuitively what the semantics are. The point that they are making here is that executable code is unambiguous. Okay? It's clear, the compiler has a semantics, you know what a C statement is, and this is good, right? Because we're actually verifying something which is clear and what actually is going to run at some point, but it's overwhelming with respect to the amount of detail that you have. You are tr yes, yes, I know. I, I, even here I simplify, I know that. I know that. <laughs> oh my God. Okay, Pascal, Pascal code, yes. Um, so what they said is when they want to understand whether they have a, a flaw, whether they have a bug in their design, they want to capture the essence of the design which doesn't mean the essence of design doesn't mean you have to have all details, right? And they wanted to have a precise description of that. Um, so that's that's for the modeling, right? There, there, there is there is the the task we have to address that if you have a design of a big system and you want to to verify the design, you have to have a precise way that models this design. And, uh, and doesn't keep too much detail from implementations, right, in order to make it uh, amenable to automatic verification. 
Um, what they also say is that they, it's not only about modeling, but it's also about you know, tool support, about uh, ver automated verification. And the reason is that if you design a system, you have something in mind. You have the common case in mind, you have in mind what you would like the system to do, and you describe what you would like the system to do, but then in what you describe, there are some cases which you didn't think of, right? And what to describe here is that uh, they had here a bug that contained uh, the shortest error trace had 35 high-level steps, so which means a lot of components involved, mostly, I don't know, it's Amazon, they don't give details, right? But a lot of components evolved in a lot of high level steps. And it's a very complicated you know, sequence of unlucky actions that actually lead to the bug. So you cannot find a bug that consists of 35 high level steps by doing code testing. It's impossible. You cannot even do it by you know, staring at it as an engineer and trying to find it out. Right? You, have to, you have to have tool support that helps you in doing that. <laughs> And, uh, and this is the kind of motivations that also started or motivated us in the last years to, to do this work. So we want to have a high-level description of the design. In our case, this design is the distributed algorithm. Okay. We want to verify this design. We don't, at this point, are not uh, interested in the implementation. That's a different issue, right? We want to find this design bug, so it falls in the distributed algorithm. And we want verification methods, okay? which means that every time we take a decision of what detail we include in the model, we have to, be sh we have to understand that this might involve a big amount of complexity on the verification side. So we need to strike the balance between expressiveness and between being able to do automated verification. So the verification approach we do is model checking or parameterized model checking uh, uh, as Igor will talk about tomorrow in a very exciting, two very exciting talks. And, uh, and we targeted folder and display algorithms. That is what, what, our, what our approach is. And in particular, we're not interested in mathematical toy examples. We're also not interested in... I mean, more studied concurrent systems like mutual exclusion algorithms. There has been a huge literature on the verification of safety of mutual exclusion algorithms. We want these fault tolerant designs and we want to verify them automatically. So the reason we want to do model checking is because it's a different, uh, different approach to, pro to proving. Right? The goal there is to find a counterexample. It's automatic. And even in the, if, we, if we look at them from the mathematical viewpoint, and I review the proofs I've done in the past, and the verification methods we have now, it's different kinds of, 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 of proof strategies. The new one is, does a lot of with abstraction, with automation, and only the tricky part we do this uh, uh, model checking, the exhaustive state exploration. More, the nice, the, the selling argument for model checking is that it gives you a counterexample. So model checking is an automated method that will produce you a counterexample if there is a bug in the system. And this is an invaluable tool in the, in the, for, the design of, for designing systems and for fixing systems. Right? If, you just would, if the tool would just say there is a bug, it doesn't help you. The moment you get an error trace, you can sit down, look at the program, try to follow this error trace and fix the program. It's a very important property of model checking. Um, we can define and vary assumptions about the system. For example, we have talked about the resilience conditions, like n is greater than 3t, n is greater than 5t. In our methods, we can vary them. Okay? We can change them slightly. We can say n is greater or equal than 3t, and we can see, oh, if we do that, this property breaks. Okay. Um, and it has a good degree of automation. Model checking is awesome. So. The challenges we have, the big challenges we have, is unbounded data types. So in distributed algorithms, we like, for example, counters, right? We count messages, they are unbounded in principle. We like round numbers, they are unbounded in principles. 
And we have parameters, as I have explained, in the resilience conditions. We have different kinds of fault models. So these, are the, these blue ones here are the, the challenges we're going to talk about today and uh, tomorrow. Um, other challenges that we have is different degrees of concurrency and continuous time, and uh, people work on it and we work on it, but it's not, not in this presentation. So to recall, this is what we have, right? A system of processes communicating some are faulty, um, and uh, I have here collected the challenges. So challenge one is we have fault models. That's not classic in, in verification. Right? In verification, you have a program that you want to test whether, the, whether, the, whether the, the program reaches its goal. What you want to do here is you, want to, you have a distributed algorithm and want to check whether this algorithm is correct under these fault assumptions. So you have to capture these fault models inside your model. You have to be sure that you properly describe these different fault models in your modeling. <coughs> the second problem is that these algorithms, these designs, are given in pseudocode and natural language, English. Right? That's also something that is, I mean, quite quite typically for, for you know other verification tasks. Often you have this design given informally, you know, with some boxes. It's not clear what the semantics of boxes is. But that's what we have, right? So we have to formulate the pseudocode in a way that is uh, precise. We have to ensure that it does not do oversimplifications. If you look in the verification literature, there are a lot of results that oversimplified algorithms for the literature, and by this cut the complexity of the, of the verification task enormously. Um, and the second problem is that, as we have seen before, there was this code of this algorithm, you know, with this n minus t rule and the t plus 1 rule, and still there were all things hidden, right? We didn't know how messages are transmitted, how long it takes to transmit a message, we didn't know about faults, we didn't know how many processes are faulty. And all this is written in English. So we have to take this English description here and, and, and map it into a formal model. Um, yeah, these are the, the examples I just mentioned. So, from a, what I said here already is that it's very, um, um, it's not clear what happens here, right? Where are the messages are actually received and, uh, and, and sent, so I want to give a more, um, a more systematic view about what happens, okay? So here we have one loop that is repeated over and over again. This is, these are the computation steps, and each of these steps, each loop iteration is atomic. And what you conceptually do is you receive a message in the beginning, you do a computation, uh, you change local variables, um, and then you send messages. This is the, the structure of a computational step in, in, in these in this algorithms. And for the modeling, what we have to understand is that receiving is typically implicit. We don't know how it's received. It's even, it's even worse. We don't know how the data structure looks like, right? You receive a message, you put it in some data structure, most likely in a real program, you don't know how it looks like. It's very, very informal. And, and the other steps are in pseudocode, and we have to formalize this. Um, so this is, a, this is a challenge, this formalization. The, the next challenge is parameterization. The real verification problem that Igor is going to talk about tomorrow is a parameterized one. We want to verify the design we want to verify the algorithm, which means we want to verify it for all system sizes. It's the important point here is all system sizes, which means big systems. Okay? So we're not only interested in small examples where you have three processes, 10 processes. We want, in principle, to be able to, to model check 30, which is already a challenge for model checking, or 100 or 100,000. I don't know. So we have a program, I come back to that here, to, to mention that what you see here is that this code here is parameterized, right? You have in the code these parameters, which means that you have actually a process template which is parameterized, which we call PNTF. So you have a process template, you have a resilience condition, and you have some fairness constraints, like all messages that are sent are going to be received, that you have a formula, 
and you have a parameterized model checking question. The parameterized model checking question is whether for all combinations of parameters that satisfy the resilience condition, the system that is composed out of these parameterized processes satisfies the specification. This is what's written here in this, in this logic formula. Um, again, since we want to show it for all n and t and f, and what you see here is that the resilience condition allows an infinite number of different combina combina uh, combinations of parameter values, we have an infinite family of systems. So we want to verify this infinite family of, of systems. That's a challenge. And there's also a challenge for the, for the modeling. We have to find a modeling that is able to, to, to cut this complexity that is just due to system size. And as I said before, we have seen, we have shown, looked at this example of the consensus specifications and the interplay of safety of life and safety and liveness. Uh, this interplay is, is complicated, and in particular, when it comes to model checking and to verification, the liveness part is something which has not been uh, researched enough, I would say. As, as I've shown before in the third example, um, doing nothing is always safe. So, from my viewpoint as a distributed algorithm designer or researcher, just doing safety is not enough. I know, safety, I know safety is the, huge, the hugest amount of research, but it's, it's not enough for practical purposes in fault tolerance. So, we have seen this, these challenges. We have to model faults, we have to model communication medium, we have to model uh, the algorithms. All this is given to us in a very informal way, typically. And we want to verify safety and liveness of parameterized systems with unbounded integers and with non standard fairness constraints. So it's uh, all a complicated tasks. Yeah. And we want, to we want to start here with discussing how to address this from a modeling, from a modeling viewpoint. So, of course, we can start with uh, existing with existing formalisms, and there is a quite quite large uh, uh, literature. I just have here the, the fam most famous one. So there is TLA and TLA plus and Pascal by by Lamport, which is basically based on temporal logic. There is um, which is which is good for writing specifications, but you really have to be a logic person to write that, right? An engineer is not going to write logical specifications. What is closer to this engineering mindset is timed automata. So it's an it's automata, it's basically state machines. Uh, this is by Nancy Lynch and the entire group. And this is all on the design and specification side. So it's very high level, uh, which is similar PVS, it's a theorem proof it allows you to 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 write designs and specifications. The problem is there that it's very rich. Yeah, you can write basically everything. And the moment you can write everything, uh, you cannot do verification in an, efficient, in an efficient way. On the simulation implementation side, you have uh, Distal, for example, which is a library for, for, um, that focuses on distributed algorithms. It focuses on these threshold guards we have seen before where you wait for messages. And you have actually implementations. And the questions now, you, so we have these implementations, we have these high-level things, we have distal, which focuses very much on, 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 on specific uh, instructions of distributed algorithms. The question is, where do, we, where do we put ourselves in the formalization to reach our goals? I think I've said all that already. Um, the important thing, so, these, these formalisms here, so TLA and PVS and IO Thomas, they are made for theorem provers, so for proof checkers. Basically, you write the proof in the, compu in the computer and the computer checks that the proof is correct. And what even these people, so John Rushby gave a talk and he said the underlying principle of this thing is that everything is possible but nothing is easy. Okay? And it's really a pain to write a proof in PVS and, and, and Isabel and things like that. It's, it's hard work. So, 
I encourage everyone to do to write proofs in disparate algorithms in TLA or uh, in proof assistance, but um, it's hard work. Um, yes, here we have these other things. So what I do now in the in, in, in this talk, I introduce an efficient encoding in Promela. So I will give you first some some the, the basic notions of, of, of Promela, which is a uh, language of the of the spin model checker, and we present some some results where we found counterexamples and could verify algorithms. So the idea is that we introduce a modeling, we check this modeling against fixed parameters, small systems, systems of size four, systems of size seven, and check whether the counterexamples and the verification results we have are consistent with the literature. The moment these are consistent with the literature, we can say that our modeling is adequate, it's good, and then Igor can start tomorrow and talk about parameterized verification. So, I don't know how many of you know Promela. So, Promela is a, a, called, it's a process meta language, it's the language, the input language of the spin model checker. It has very much the look and feel of C, but it's, 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 not it allows much more non to express more non-determinism. And yeah, the details you can find on on this web page. Gerhard Holtzmann is working for, for for NASA in the in the JPL. So what spin allows you to do is spin allows you to 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 create processes. So You just you can create here two processes of process type process A and of you can have a process of process type B and at any time you can actually run a process. So spin is initially already made to have concurrency. You can have different processes that run that run in parallel, which is which is good start for, for the distributed algorithms. And actually it has been designed for the verification of of of, of protocols. So there are some some features which are pretty close to what we need, but as we will see, not close enough. Um, you, can, you can do typical things. You can have shared variables, uh, X and Y. You can have local variables. Uh, you can have assignments. Uh, what is a little bit uh, untypical in Promela is that you can have these conditions here as statements. You can have X is greater than Y. What happens then is that at this part of the code you block until this condition becomes true. And since it's a concurrent system, you describe a concurrent system, it might be that the other process does a step that makes this thingy come true, and then you can continue. Which also means that you, that you can have a statement like true, which just takes a step, uh, and you can have skip, which is the same as true. So you have the basic things that you find in programming languages. The, the major feature in, 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 well, for our purposes is that spin allows uh, non-determinism in control flow. So you can write here a guarded uh, command like uh, programs, where uh, these guarded commands, they are inside these if statements here, and if each of these guarded commands started with these uh, double points here, and uh, Spin ev evaluates the first expression, and the, among the first expressions that evaluate to true, it non-deterministically non can choose one to execute. So here we have a very nice feature to, to express non-determinism, which we will use to, later to, to, to express the non-determinism that we have in message passing, for example. Um, which also means that this non-determinism can create different kind of executions. So we have here this, this uh, I have here three, three different runs. I have here, um, so initially x is zero and y is zero, which means that initially any of those two, those, th those two uh, guard, guards ever write to true, which means that spin may choose one of those, right? So you can have run, run one, when the first statement is chosen, you can have run two when the second statement is chosen. 
and then you can have different 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 combinations of that. Um, we'll come to that example back, I think. And what you have here is you have this kind of loops, and when we recall what how our display diagrams look like, that you have big, you know, a huge piece of code that is repeatedly executed, we can do this with these loops. So they have just these loops where you repeatedly check these guards. Yeah. Um, so, and spin generates it searches the whole the whole in the whole uh, execution space for all kinds of interleavings. So if you have a, a program like that where you just swap the values of x and y, uh, starting from from the case where you have zero and one here, you you see that uh, you can have this this red one here, this red run where you once execute process zero, then execute process one, then zero, then one. And this is because these two statements, each statement is one is one atomic block. So it's just possible to execute one of these steps of one process and then change, basically, make a scheduling decision and let the other process um, do the run. Since we have atomic steps, big atomic steps in these algorithms, we want to, we want to pretend that, prevent that, and SPIN allows us to do that. So SPIN has this um, atomic statement which enforces that these two statements are always executed together. And what you see here is that uh, with this, the execution space becomes smaller, which, is, which can be good and which can be bad, because if you want this, if this is the kind of atomicity you have, and we have big atomicity, so that we use it, it's, it's a good idea. But of course, if you have uh, actually in a system interleaving semantics and you kill this by atomicity, you can have your verification results can be wrong. So I think that's the. So this is this was about interleavings. It was about atomicity. What spin also has is message passing, um, in a very specific way because everything is, everything is blocking here. So you can put something into a, into a message buffer. Uh, for example, bang a here. I put a into the channel one message buffer. And then here, I ask, is A in channel 1? And at this point, I block. This is a blocking, a blocking receive statement. Similarly, as the channel has bounded length, we have here a channel of size 1. If the channel is full and I want to put something into the, into the channel, then also the sending is blocking. And this kind of blocking does not correspond to distributed algorithms. It's a problem. Um, I think I have to skip that. So to to end this short introduction, is Promela is that Promela looks like C, but it's not totally. It allows a lot of non-determinism, and uh, it's very much streamlined to 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 protocol verification and to message passing. And it's a modeling language. And there's tool support and good tool support. But the point is, and this is the uh, statement of the talks, it, that it's. Um, not perfectly suitable for, for our purposes. So, yes? I agree with you. I agree. It's a selling argument, you know, and the point is also you want to, you want people to use you want people to use it, and somehow the impression is everyone understands C. But I agree with you, it's not a... I mean, it's... It's, a it's a totally misleading, it's simply a wrong approach. Yes, yes, yes. Yes, I agree. I mean, <laughs> if, 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 uh, no. if at some point in the future computer science becomes a mature discipline, like mathematics and, and physics, perhaps we can, you know, do this intellectual jump. But perhaps we are too young as a discipline. Um, I think I will have to skip some of the formal parts because I'm short of time, right? I have 10 minutes left or something. Um, so what I would like to talk about is about the encoding that we, that we are using. 
um, and to fix parameter, fix parameter results. So the encoding that we're using is very much uh, um, adapted to the kind of systems we want to verify. And these are the, the features of the algorithms that we are focusing on. Point one, it's that the, ma the major point is uh, message counting. So we have seen that the algorithm just consists of sending messages, receiving messages, and counting how many messages you have received. So this counting is very central for us. So we focus on that. A second thing is that this message passing is specific and that we always send messages to all, right? That's typical for consensus-like algorithms because we want to have coordination, right? We just don't want to send a point-to-point -point message, but we want to achieve some global property, so it's very likely that you're going to, to send to all. And the second thing is that uh, what happens to wh how faults affect us, right? And the point is basically if you think about crash faults, it could just be that some messages are missing at the receiver side. And if we talk about Byzantine faults, messages could be missing, but we could also have additional messages. And these are the things we have to capture. So, and we, these are the case studies we are, we are, we are, we are, we are using here. So this is the algorithm, we have seen it before. Again, the feature, it has threshold guards. The only thing that the algorithm has is this if statements, which are threshold guards. It has sent to all communication. That's what I mentioned before. And there's some more case studies we're looking at, and they have some, some more features. You have Byzantine faults, you have different kinds of messages. So for example, here, in this example, you only have echo messages, but you can have different kinds of messages. Dif for example, this condition-based consensus has four message types. We have different status variables, we have different properties to verify. Just to show you that we actually have a couple of case studies. And to, to motivate you, here are the results. And since it's, uh, since it's small, I, 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 I focus on, 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 on some of them. And what you see is for these specific uh, small systems that we, that we verified, and the parameterized verification of the big system comes tomorrow, uh, we have... Uh, the verification results are consistent with the literature. So what you see here is that we have resilience conditions and we have parameter values. And on the parameter uh, side, when you have red entries, which means that you have a violation of the resilience condition. And if you have a violation of the resilience condition, we expect to find a bug. And what you see on the right side is then which of the properties, these are the unforgeability, correctness, and relay properties of the broadcast, are actually violated. And what you see is that in the cases where the parameters satisfy the resilience condition, the algorithm, uh, the, the algorithm is verified, and the moment you change the value, we find a bug. So our modeling is good. There are more results, but I'm short in time. Um, um, This also talked about. So, just to recall, the major point is that we have a counting argument. We have a send to all, and we, we collect the messages we've received, we count the messages, and we compare these messages against the threshold. So, how do we, how do we model that? Um, and we're going to give you, I'm, I'm going to discuss two, two solutions to that. One solution is some of the straightforward implementation that if you would tell a student to implement this algorithm with Homela, the student would most likely come up with, and the way we, we, we did it in a more abstract way. So, um, here we have this, 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 this loop. So what happens here is that you have a variable which is called n received, which counts the number of received messages, and then you have this atomic step, that's the big way to the receive, the computer and the send, and you have this, you have this loop. Um, where are we? So somewhat the standard encoding that you would do in Pomela is you would have channels between all the processes, right? You would have n times n channels, and then when you want to send a message to all, what you would do is you would just put an echo message in each of the outgoing channels of the of the process. This is quite straightforward. 
The problem is on the receive side. While the classic promailer receive is just one statement uh, of, uh, with this question mark here, the problem is that the receive is a, is a, a blocking receive. And the moment you have a message in the buffer and you make a receive, you are guaranteed to receive that message, which does not capture the semantics of, um, of the distributed algorithms. And to in properly encode non-blocking receive, you would have to have this kind of huge code. I don't want to go into the details, but you see that the receive statement is a very complicated thing. So what we did instead, what we did instead is we focus on the structure of the algorithm. And we just have one variable, which is nSend, which captures the number of processes that have sent a message. And sending a message is done by a simple plus plus. And receiving is done by uh, a statement like this, which says that if the number of received messages is less than the number of messages sent, then you're allowed to receive a message. But also, you can just skip. So. If there are messages, in, if there are mes more messages sent than you have received by now, you may receive them, but you don't need to. This captures this non-blocking receive statement. Now the problem is, if you have this, this skip statement here, it means that the received could always remain zero, but you want to capture reliable communication. So what you do is you have to in, in, uh, give a fairness property, which says that uh, from some time on. For all processes, the number of received uh, messages is greater or equal to the number of sent messages. So here you capture the reliable communication, the communication part. So then the second thing is of course faults, how to model faults. So in principle, what you and what is the standard approach which also Lambo takes in these models is to explicitly write code that captures all the possible non-determinism to send a message or not send a message. And then you have, you create f of these processes. So you have actually a faulty process in your system. What we found is that it's not very efficient. It's much better to focus on the impact of faults. So you don't model faults explicitly. You only focus on the impact they have on the side of correct processes, which means that you can receive additional messages. So you can receive messages, you can receive more messages than have been sent by correct process. That's all the impact that faulty processes can have. And for fairness, uh, uh, fairness is the same thing here. So, um, with different, with, with similar modeling about additional message that you can receive with different kind of fairness assumptions. You can model Byzantine faults, you can model omission faults, and you can also model, also model crash faults. Um, what I just want to show is that uh, this, uh, this, this modeling is uh, scales is very good, is uh, much more efficient. So here you have the blue line is the standard, well, the more straightforward encoding of channels and the explicit processes. And what you see, uh, you have a logarithmic scale here. It explodes very quickly uh, in the number of processes, while the shared variables and fold injection behave very nicely. And what we will see tomorrow is that this has also this encoding has very nice property when it goes to parameterization. Igor will explain w one or two techniques that can that we used we can use this encoding to verify systems of all sizes. Um, that's all, I think. Thanks. Any questions? Why spin, not another model checker? Basically, a uh, more general question. What form of technique to learn and to teach? Uh, so the, the, the point here was not really f for spin, 
the, the point for was for Promela. Promela has a is a is a language that that allows to 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 express these kind of protocols very nicely. Uh, yes. <laughs> well, there are very there are several standard languages for this for that are used in engineering for specification and uh, well for specification of distributed systems like SDL and uh, Lotus Stella. Why not them? They also have formal semantics. I mean, the point is, it's uh, we are <laughs> we are not very. M the point here is wanted to what I wanted to explain is that all the languages we looked at were not suitable to describe uh, the message passing distributed algorithms in a in a in a way. If you look at SRL, it's uh, it's synchronous systems very tight tightly coupled, for example. Uh, there are other formalisms that have a lot of detail. The point what we want to have really is to to express in a in a at the end, you know, after we have this modeling, just a very easy way to talk about shared var var uh, variable systems. And we are not, I mean, I'm not preaching to you should, that uh, you should use Promella. The point was just to uh, to explain the the modeling in a in a in a formal in a formal framework. Yeah, we have looked at other things, other other verification like SMV, and it's, it's all very. It's every. The problem is that, in particular, here you have to understand what kind of design you want to you want to to verify, and you have to choose the language according to the design. It's very. It's like like we say always for for our students first understand which is the best language for the, for the problem you have to solve. It's the same thing, very much the same thing here. The following question. Uh, there are programming languages in which uh, there are instructions of generating new pro processes, like uh, the uh, instruction join, uh, fork, and join in Unix. And the property of uh, fault tolerance of such programs, for example, can be look like uh, uh, any uh, crashing of such uh, generated processes uh, cannot uh, spoil the result of whole program. Does your approach valid for verification of such properties? I uh, please, please take you into account that a number of generated processes can be unbounded. For example, MPI can generate uh, unbounded set of processes, uh, for example, matrix multiplication, etc. And uh, how you can prove that any crushing of the generated processes can uh, not spoil the result of the program? So what, what we have presented here were results for fixed size systems. Igor will talk about parameterized systems tomorrow. And I mean, I would like to say to you now, yes, but the point is before you have you know, encoded the, what you want to, to verify and, and run the results, it's, 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 not, it's not clear. But we have, um, we, we compared our, our tool to, uh, to, to other tools that deal with with process generations and process generation and 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 we do we do pretty well. We haven't looked into case studies yet that actually can generate, but it's we should do that next. It's a good it's a good question. And the moment we we look into parameterization, the the number of number of processes we can deal with large numbers and we can deal with generations. But of course, it's always. You have to look at the specific case study whether it actually goes through the automated method or not. I already have uh, some maybe industrial applications. Well, we verify these designs. No, we don't have industrial applications. And we are uh, at the very we are at the very beginning. Also, the question is when you talk about industrial applications, um, and what you have what you have in mind. The there. second part of my question uh, is uh, what the real size of problem you can operate with. I mean, how many processes, modules interacting? So, Igor will show you tomorrow a parameterization method, and we can verify for all system sizes. Uh, so we can we can handle uh, all sizes, okay, Thank for you. the specific algorithms. So it's not like general purpose general purpose language. But I want to come back to the for the first question. I want to come back to the to the beginning of the talk. When we see about, when we, um, I don't need it. 
when you think about the, the results or the, the insights from the Amazon engineers, right? The question is what you understand about industrial, industrial um, uh, parts, right? So we're working on designs. We want to do design verification. If you understand this industrial is code, source code, we're not even trying to go there. We really want to verify, verify designs and look at specific designs here. And uh, um. uh, thank you. And uh, one <coughs> more in continue for the question: uh, What's the scale of the solution? I mean, what the uh, delay plus meaning uh, on the Amazon? experience. Uh, they found the uh, counter example for 33 steps and that's required a huge uh, plat platform to Yes, two terabytes. So to what did they have? <laughs> yes, so our, I don't know, how to do it, two, two gigabytes or something of, 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 do we have results for that? So this is for the fixed size for the fixed size system, and you see here we go to to eight gigabyte on of of of, of memory. So we it's normal computers. You don't need a cloud, you don't need a cloud to do that. And if I recall correctly, for the parameterization result, uh, Ika will talk about tomorrow. We will uh, we are at this at the at the comparable to the seven processes here, okay? So the parameterization is not much more complicated than verification of seven processes. So we are in the, in the two gigabyte uh, memory scale. So that's, that's, that's doable. But I mean, for these case studies, for more complicated states, case studies, we have other approaches and Igor will also talk about them. It's we all, you know, we're moving slowly to bigger, to bigger case studies. I am interested in uh, your using of the PVS prover. Uh, it's d uh, usually difficult uh, and uh, time consuming. Uh, was there any um, real practical uh, program, not example program? What there was. was. I've, we've organized this actual seminar last year, and I think in was it Gavin Klein who had who had this, um, this, this huge uh, software system of a couple of thousand lines of codes. And basically, he had students you know, verifying uh, all the whole system. And it took them, I don't know how many, many years, huge amount of, of time to, to verify that. But it has been done. So it ha people have used it. Uh, did he use PVS? I don't remember. Isabel. He used Isabel to, to, to verify a huge code system with a lot of people and a lot of time and, uh, and people were you know, trained in, in doing that. So it's, it's doable, but whether it's practical and whether it's uh, the right approach for all systems, it's, it's not clear. Yeah. But it's, you can do that if you have time and a lot of students. <laughs> 